30 minutes, you've got a mentor. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Asha Bay, and I'm joining you from the Office of Alumni Affairs and ECA at the US Department of State. Our office opens the door to a global network of millions of exchange program alumni, professional development, and grant opportunities. Mentor Talks is a virtual series that features exchange program alumni and others sharing their stories, mentorship, and advice. It is your opportunity to connect with these leaders and mentors. Like our guest today, Patty Heenich, award-winning chef, author, and TV host. Patty has been a cultural envoy for many years through her national public television shows, Patty's Mexican Table and La Frontera with Patty Heenich, as well as through events at the White House. She's joining us to talk about her journey from foreign policy to food and food diplomacy. She'll also answer your career-related questions. What would you like to ask Patty? Post your questions in the comments. Now, let's say hello to our guest. Hi, Asha. Hello, Patty. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so You're glad to be able to connect. I'm so glad you were able to join us too. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule. So, we don't have we we only have a short amount of time, so I'm just gonna dive right in. I read that when you first got married, you didn't know how to scramble an egg. So, <laughs> how did you go from studying political science and foreign affairs to becoming an award-winning chef, TV host, and author? I mean, I think definitely, Asha. I did not know how to scramble an egg. I could whip up a quesadilla, but um, it was very very basic. I think it was the weight of nostalgia. When I moved to the U.S., I, I had finished a degree in political science and I was working hard to apply to do my graduate studies here in the U.S. I had never lived in the U.S. and I really wanted to study abroad. But then I met my husband and my husband is a little bit older than me. He had already finished school. He, would, he had already worked. Uh, he was already working. So we agreed that we would move wherever he found the job. And that is how we found ourselves in Dallas, Texas. I had never been to Dallas, um, had never been to Texas really, I think. And, um, and I couldn't travel to Mexico because I was applying for my working papers. So it was that nostalgia and that seeing Mexico from abroad made me miss it so much. And miss the flavors and the foods and the people and so that led me to the kitchen because it was by way of the kitchen and learning how to cook the foods that had nurtured me growing up that I felt close to home and ironically it was also a way for me to start growing roots here in America. Ah okay and so you you actually but you actually went to Georgetown University and got your <laughs> master's degree in public policy. Yeah. Um, and and I just I also noticed that you you mentioned your husband and I think he was also pivotal in your career shift. Am I right? Yes, he was very and I was very stubborn, Asha, because when we moved here to the U.S. and I was working on my thesis, so I did a um, political science BA in Mexico City in a university called ITAM, and I was doing a thesis that took me three years to complete, and it was titled um, The Removal of Governors and Federalism in Mexico, where I studied every single removal of every single governor since Mexico became an independent country in 1821 to 1994. And uh, when we moved to Texas, I was working on that thesis and I thought I wanted to be an academic and I wanted to find a way to give back to Mexico, a country that had welcomed my ancestors who were refugees, uh, political refugees, uh, religious refugees, refugees of all sorts who had tried to come to the U.S. actually and found their way to Mexico and made Mexico their home. And it was my way of saying, I want to help this country. I want to help my country. And 
strengthen the institutions and I want to be an academic. Then we moved to the U.S. and my focus was try to help to strengthen democratic institutions and civic culture in Mexico and also try to help bridges between Mexico and the U.S., all very idealist, hard to achieve things, uh, which you all work on, very hard uh, on. And then I applied to Georgetown and got a merit scholarship for a master's in Latin American studies. We moved to Washington, D.C. My husband found a job here and I started working in a think tank called the Inter-American Dialogue, uh, which I thought was going to be my dream job. And I was miserable, Asha. All I was thinking about was food and all I was thinking about was all the myths and preconceptions about Mexicans in the U.S. and um, ways to open windows to, to understanding uh, what seems to be the other in the U.S., which is all of us anyway. And so I really wanted to go into cooking, but I didn't want to... Um, as my father used to tell me when I told him about my desire to switch into food, he was like, you're going to waste all those years of studying and we put you through college and you got that merit scholarship and you work so hard and now you're going to go into the kitchen to rinse pots and pans. Like, what are you thinking, Patty? And, um, and so it was like almost two years of anguish thinking, what am I doing? I'm going to throw all of these, you know, to the trash can. And finally, I couldn't do it any longer. And a colleague at the Inter-American Dialogue, I think I had told you this story, um, started to talk about ceviches in Peru. And I had been tasked uh, by the president of the Inter-American Dialogue to write a paper comparing the transition to democracy in Peru and Mexico. And instead of doing that, I started researching ceviches in Peru and Mexico because he kept saying that ceviches in Peru were that much better. And I had never been to Peru and I was like, all the wrong buttons had been pushed. And I was like, what do you mean Peru, Peruvian ceviches are better than Mexican? I know Mexican ceviches are extraordinary and I bet you we got to them first. So that led me to this research and... I came to the president of the dialogue, Michael Shifter, who's a really dear friend. And I said, look, you wanted me to write this essay on democracy. I wrote this essay on ceviches. And, <laughs> and I will write an essay in, on democracy on time, but I think I need to resign. And I resigned and enrolled in culinary school at night. And my husband was always very supportive. And, you know, because by then... We had two kids. I was already contributing to, you know, our family's income. And this meant stopping to work and investing more in school. So um, he was very supportive. But he's always also been, which is great, my biggest critic. <laughs> since I started teaching at the Mexican Cultural Institute. And the, the crazy thing was that once I started teaching at the Mexican Cultural Institute, Institute, I put together a program um, for, for cooking classes, but I started touching on my political analysis and historian vein because the classes that I started teaching was I wanted to create a, a curriculum that really went deep into not only Mexico's diverse, Mexico's diverse culinary regions, but Mexico's history and the evolution of how different immigrant waves and historical times have impacted cuisine while giving people really practical, delicious recipes. So I started teaching classes on the foods of the Mexican Revolution and the foods of the Spanish convents in Mexico, which were crucial in colonial times. And anyway, I know I'm going um, <laughs> many different things here. I apologize. No, that's great. Yeah, he, it's my husband was a big supporter and always to this day, a, my toughest critic, which is a great combination to have. Okay. So it sounds like, yeah, once you were at the Mexican Culture Institute, that was kind of the route to maybe your, your TV show, Patty's Mexican Table? Yes, absolutely. So I put together this thorough curriculum to teach at the Mexican Cultural Institute. And in order to do that, 
I had to bring um, sponsors and supporters who supported, of course, the program and also get people interested in attending the classes. And in order to get people interested in attending the classes, I started going um, to local radio stations and TV stations to do cooking demos and then say, if you want to watch this chicken tinga for Cinco de Mayo, come to the Institute, there's a class. So I started doing that to promote the classes and because I wanted to do right by the Institute who had opened, you know, its doors for me to teach there. And I wanted to just fill those classes and have a lot of people come and experience the Institute. And by way of trying to promote the classes, I realized how much I love media and how much I love telling and sharing stories. And so that um, evolved into those same um, class structures that I had at the Institute, which was weaving history, weaving a place, weaving its people, its culture with its food while giving people a solution for a Wednesday night dinner that involved enriching their kitchen and their home with ingredients and foods from other cultures. And in this case, your neighboring country, um, it was just so satisfying. And, and of course, if I look back, I can say it's always been extremely challenging. There's been obstacles to no end. But that's why I tell people, do not prepare. If you want to do something, just jump for it. Because if you're trying to research what the obstacles are going to be, you're just not going to do it. Because no, I wouldn't do it again if I knew all I know now. Wow. So yeah. what were some of those obstacles? Ah, uh, well, um, you know, it was very difficult when I started with the cooking show, which was like 10, 11 years ago. Um, to have a Mexican be the host of a Mexican cooking show in the mainstream, in an American, you know, in an English speaking um, channel. Um, my accent was a problem um, in, you know, I was pitched to different networks and, and my accent, my heavy accent was a problem. There was the the thought in some instances that um, Mexican cuisine was way too niche, uh, that America wasn't that ready for a, you know, a TV series on just Mexican cooking. And here we are 10 years later, right? Like Mexican food is so, such a part of the mainstream. Um, but I think then, yeah, it was, it was very hard with the accent, with the focus on only Mexican um, and also what I wanted to do didn't quite fit in a traditional travel show or cooking show because my show is a combination of both. And I felt very strongly that there needed to be a combination of both. So I ended up going through the public TV route, which has been wonderful because there's such an incredible community there, a very loyal audience that really appreciates substantial deep content and um we're now going on our 11th season and we've traveled so many regions of mexico and after many years of going back and forth um to mexico and the u.s and exploring first the regions that i already knew and loved and missed you know oaxaca puebla mexico city and increasingly wanting to go to the regions that I didn't know and wanted to learn from, which has been so humbling because you realize how little you know about your own home country. But at the same time, all these treading back and forth um, made me change my relationship with my audience because it went from showing them what I already knew to them experiencing with me what I didn't know and what I'm learning. And after 10 years of doing that, I realized that if it had been and continues to be challenging to break myths and preconceptions about Mexico's cuisine and culture, um, and, you know, Mexicans and Mexican food tend to be narrowly labeled, it is at the border where the biggest misconceptions are, where there's even more narrow labeling, um, demonizing. And, you know, I knew so many people from the borderlands and I had visited and it started attracting me like this magnet, you know, being a, um, 
A descendant of Jewish refugees in Mexico, who was born in Mexico, Mexican family, you know, third generation, and then moving to the U.S. and being a Mexican-American here with a strong Mexican accent, being maybe too Mexican for the U.S., but being, a, you know, a descendant of refugees in Mexico, not from here, not from there. My kids are Mexican-American. Um, and at the border, it just felt like, you can be anything, you can be anywhere because there's this constant negotiation um, inside of each person that lives at the borderlands. They have to switch and navigate to English, to Spanish. They have to switch and navigate between cultures. They understand the cultural and historical and everyday currency of two different cultures and rules of law and institutions and systems. And they are so adaptable and accessible and loving and enrich not only one country, but two, plus that third dimension. And that led me to want to create La Frontera with Patti Hidich, which was my venture, my first time in, in prime time in PBS National and um, in Amazon Prime. And that just launched this October. And it's it's made me come full circle, Asha, because um, of course I still do food and eat all of the food and I love to experience and explain the world through food, but it's taking me back to those deeper, more substantial themes that I was studying at Georgetown and Aritam and, you know, um, while I was working at the Dialogue, but it's been fascinating to be able to do it through food because in the kitchen is really the most noble place where people will just allow you to bring the walls down, lift the veils, to talk about themes, have conversations that if you don't have that food in front of you, it's just much more difficult to do because we connect to food in the most primal, animal a way. Because the food that nurtured you, the food that you know, the food that you eat, identify with you have a weakness for right so when you're sharing exactly. it when people are sharing it you just connect in a way that you otherwise can't yes yeah so that was that was yeah you bought it full circle from you were able to not waste your your education and you were able to bring it together so i have to tell you that we have we have people from all over um joining the show we've got people from serbia nepal suriname um dc Sudan, Peru, Nigeria, Bolivia. Um, in fact, we have a question from Bolivia, um, from Charo. How much time did it take you to get to know Peruvian culture and cuisine? Oh, I mean, I haven't even gotten started. Um, so I had done a lot of research um, when I was an undergraduate, then a graduate, then I worked at the think tank in terms of it's history, it's politics, um, but the food, uh, I'm just getting to know. My first time physically in Peru was um, last August when I went with my family, I went with my husband and my boys, and I was so fascinated. So I wouldn't even be able to tell you that I know Peru much. I'm just starting to get acquainted with it. And uh, I think that Food is really one wonderful window to to understand another culture in a in an intimate, um, non prejudiced way. And so I'm I'm really using food to get to know the places that I don't know. And you know what's fascinating? To not only do the research, of course, of the place and eat the food in the country, but it's really fascinating to eat the food in the communities of immigrants of that country in other countries. So if you know Peruvians here in Washington, what it is, what is it that they crave the most, that they miss the most, that tells you so much about their home country. It's the same thing with Mexicans. Every time I'm going to go to a new region in Mexico for a new season of Paris Mexican Table, a place that I've never been to because Mexico is so gigantic and it continues to change. I start connecting with the diaspora of that state or that region and, and getting to know their stories, what they miss, what they crave, what they hanker for the most tells you so much about those places because, you know, 
nostalgia though so much you know I, I come from the land of magical realism and I love living there in, in that magical realism place um, but it really tells you a lot um, so I love connecting those two that's great yes um, yeah and speaking connecting you also mm -hmm. um, you I think you've been a cultural envoy through um, just some of your events at the White House. Um, you were a chef there for Cinco de Mayo with um, Chef Jose Andres. And you also did the Easter egg roll um, where you met the president and Mrs. Obama. And, and you held like actually some cooking classes, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, I always say that um, my, my most favorite, um, events like the things that I am the proudest of are uh, cooking for the Obamas at the White House and cooking for Elmo and Cookie Monster. And if I can put the two together, then it would be a dream and I would just be done. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> it was such an honor. So I cooked along with, with Jose Andres for a Cinco de Mayo dinner at the White House for the Obamas. And it was just extraordinary. There was like so much, so much pride about everybody working there. We cooked the most gigantic meal. I think we cooked everything, Asha. I mean, we cooked everything. And uh, there were so many things and it was so much fun. And the White House um, cooking there was such an incredible experience because we felt so welcome. Um, it was, I, I can't describe, there was like such, such hum, it was so humbling, you know, they welcomed us like, this is your place, this is everyone's place, we didn't feel like we were going to anyone's place, but they made us feel like this was truly everyone's home, and it was beautiful, and President Obama thanked us and thanked me, and he pronounced my name right, which not many people do, because in Mexico we say Hinich, and here in the U.S., and most people say Ginnick or Ginnick. <laughs> and, and I was like so happy and he cracked the joke and it was just so, so lovely. And I went again for the Easter egg roll and taught some classes out in the lawn to kids that were there about healthy cooking. And it was just such a, it's, it was such a wonderful time um, to be there at the White House. They were so celebratory of Latin culture, Latin um, cultures and cuisine. And um, and then I've also done a lot of cooking at the James Beard house, which I also feel very proud about um, because to have, you know, in one of the most important places that celebrates cuisine in America to have a Mexican food be represented, it's always made me feel really happy to bring Mexico in there. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, what was the impetus for starting La Frontera? So it was, I mean, I had, I had always felt attracted to it, right? Since I, since I was studying political science in Mexico, there's this kind of obsession from Mexico with the U.S. Like, we love the U.S., but we also want to be our own sovereign country. There's this kind of love-hate thing all the time. Like, we want to eat the hamburgers, the pizza, the, the milkshakes, but don't touch our tacos. You know, there's <laughs> this kind of a, of a thing because we're like siblings, right? We rely on each other so much. Like, we admire so deeply the institutions, the democracy, the rule of law. But Mexico's always saying, like, don't get involved in our internal matters. You know, so it's these this continues back and forth, yet we depend on each other so much. And there's so much that goes on between the countries that's so positive that we couldn't do without each other. And, and the border is a place where there's that continuous robbing and clash all the time. And the more the years passed of me living in the U.S. and the more I went back and forth between the country, the more I felt attracted to the border and to the themes there, the people there. Um, I started realizing more and more how misunderstood they are. Like if I thought that Mexicans and immigrants were misunderstood here, well, the people from the borderlands are even more. 
And, and so I really wanted to go to La Frontera and bring the microphone. I started really wanting to bring the microphone from the TV show to areas that didn't have a chance to speak up and say who they are by themselves. So with Patty's Mexican Table, as I was telling you, I started with the places I knew and loved and many people are familiar with, like Oaxaca and Puebla, etc. But increasingly, like I went to the Baja Peninsula in Tijuana, which is already polemic because the wall is there. And then I remember after that, I knew a lot of people from Sinaloa who loved Sinaloa, people from Sinaloa here in the U.S. who love Sinaloa, who told me so many stories about the hardworking people there and how they grow so much of the produce and, and, and you know, harvest not only the produce, but the fish and the shrimp that not only feeds Mexico, but that is exported to the U.S. a lot. And all you heard then was narcos and El Chapo and the drug cartels and so I really wanted to go into Sinaloa to bring the microphone and hear from the people. And it was very challenging to get, you know, the team that I was working with to go to Sinaloa because they were like, well, Patty, you know, our wives are watching Narcos here. We don't know if we want to go. And um, we ended up going and it was fascinating and humbling. And, and I felt emboldened, you know, like if I already did Sinaloa and the land of El Chapo, like, of course I can do the borderlands. And so um, it took a while, you know, in conversation with PBS about putting this special together. It was a, we launched with a two hour docu-series and they were very supportive and excited about bringing the stories of those that are unheard to be able to share, you know, because the borderlands, I think, are one of the regions that you hear the most of or about, but it's always um, translated, interpreted. It's never from them. They always, you know, news will go there, take whatever they need, and then put it on the news feeds, but it's just what they want to share from the borderlands, but they don't get a share to share who they are. So with these, we went from El Paso to Brownsville and really tried to cut a slice of life of what it is to live there, to continuously navigate from one side to the other. But as I say there in the trailer, like, you know, they say the grass is greener on the other side, but what is it like when you live right on the fence? And I really right. wanted to, to shine a light on that. And now we're really looking forward to doing La Frontera 2, which oh, will be great. the next season from El Paso to Tijuana. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So we're we're um, just about out of time, um, but I have one oh more. Oh my gosh, why should I think it's gone too fast? Of course, because I talked <laughs> to Tyrod. I'm sorry. It's okay. It was. It's been great hearing from you. Um, so before we go, what would be your number one tip for finding your career path or for being your own cultural envoy? I always tell this to my kids, and and I told this to my oldest son. When they asked me to do the keynote speech when he graduated from high school, which was nerve wracking for him and for me because it's embarrassing, you know, as a parent. And I told those kids, I said, you have to know what you are never willing to put on a negotiating table as you go through life. And typically it is the things that you are the most embarrassed about the things that people will ask you to change. It is your tone of voice, your accent, your culture, your identity, your things that set you apart. And those are the things that you should never put on a negotiating table because those are the things that you have to work the hardest on to be proud of, to share them, to enjoy them, to learn about them. And those are the things that you are going to be remembered about, ironically. Um, so... There's this anonymous quote that says something like, um, know where you come from to know where you need to be. And, and you know, um, I really think that, of course, one has to look forward, but look deep in the parts that, in a way, trouble you because you may find a little diamond in there. I was always embarrassed about my accent. 
Um, and I find that it's led me to a path of embracing who I am and I don't want to change it. I don't want to take lessons to mellow it, you know? Right. Yeah. I think, yeah. And it served you well. <laughs> so thank you very much, Patty, for being with us today. And a big thank you to all of our online viewers from all across the world and all around the U.S. Um, if you enjoyed our show with Patty, you may want to catch her on La Frontera with Patty Heenich on PBS or YouTube. If you're interested in learning more about Patty and other awesome exchange alumni, you can visit our website at alumni.state.gov, and you can follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and see you all soon on our next Mentor Talks. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Ashley.